Welcome to Behavior Grooves, the podcast that explores our human condition. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We talk with researchers and interesting people to unlock the mysteries of our behavior by using a behavioral science lens. And there are quite a few mysteries to be unlocked, at least with my behavior, Tim. Uh, you, you said it, man, not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you, Mr. Tim Houlihan, ever take a psych class in college? Of course I did. But, you know, for as much as I'm involved in psychology these days, I have to admit that I only took Psych 101. Ah, that explains a lot. (laughs) Well, how about you? (laughs) You got your PhD in organizational psychology, so you must have, I mean, at least behind your economics major, I'm sure you took a lot of psych, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I took a couple in undergrad, but more obviously in grad school. It's actually very interesting. As I've talked to many people, what really got me I'm um, hooked was my consumer behaviors class in my MBA, yeah, but then me too. obviously me too. when I got into, you know, my IO psychology, there was pretty much every single one of those was a psychology class. So getting back, getting back though to you, because this is all oh, about oh, you, thanks. Tim, all about you. Okay. Oh, right. Right. You in your, in your psych 101 class, is it fair to say that your professor, well, probably very good at what, you know, they did. Did they tell you the exact, the entire story of the human mind? <laughs> I, I know, I know in even all my PhD, none of mine did. They didn't tell me the entire story. There was no like, this oh. is the story of psychology. Did you get that? Not at all. Well, of course, I'm going from a very fragmented memory, but no, <laughs> that that did not happen. I'm pretty sure. Well, you know why? It's because you didn't have Dr. Paul Bloom. You know, telling and leading your class, because if you did, you might have gotten that. And that is who uh, we have as our guest today, Dr. Paul Bloom, who is the Brooks and Susan Reagan Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Cognitive Science at Yale. And and Tim, he is also a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. And and he is a uh, great author who has multiple books. And just an all-around great guy. Classic underachiever. Uh, that's, you know, uh, we did, always interview those classic underachievers. We it's amazing. always find them. It, it is the second time that we talked to Paul. And keeping with the concept of twos, we had such a wonderful and deep. And long. And, it, and long. And it was a long, okay. long uh, interview. There we go. <laughs> it was long. Conversation with Paul that we're actually going to split our conversation with him into two episodes. So, wow, Tim, we haven't done that since, let me, 2018. Certainly, yeah, certainly before the pandemic. Yeah, so this is a rare moment indeed. Well, it is. It it, it truly is, Kurt, because our conversation with Paul was rare as well. (laughs) In both episodes, we talked to Paul about his book, Psych, uh, the the story of the human mind. However, in the first episode, we're going to spend a bit more time on the history of psychology, delving into the importance of Freud and the impact that behaviorism had and, and what it was like for him working down the hall from where Henry Milgram did his famous shock studies. I mean, whoa. Now, we also, in that episode, talk about free will, neuroscience, and where the field of psychology is, or maybe in Paul's ideas, uh, should be headed. Yeah, the, that's, that's kind of the episode one synopsis. The second episode dives more into Paul's, into the book, where we talk about the impetus uh, to write psych. We talk about selfish versus altruistic behaviors and the root causes of that, nature versus nurture, universals versus individuals, language, and what makes a good life. So remember, when you're done with this part, you wait a week and you'll get part number two. So you don't want to miss that. And it's the perfect follow on to this episode. So just keep listening. Remember, listeners, that we would love to have you, our listeners, our supporters, to share this episode with your friends and to join with us on social media, have a conversation about these topics. By the way, it doesn't have to be with all of your friends. Maybe just share it with the friends who took Psych 101. (laughs) (laughs) But either way, your thoughts and your ideas and your conversation matter to us. So with that, sit back with your favorite double shot of insight on psychology and whatever else we talk about and enjoy our conversation with Paul Bloom. Paul Bloom, welcome back to Behavioral Grooves. 
Thanks so much for having me back. We are glad we're going to start with a quick speed round because we need to know if you prefer tea or coffee. Absolutely coffee. It's not even close. (laughs) Does tea even enter your life at all? I have had tea. Uh, I I don't (laughs) mind tea, but... But you didn't inhale? I I, um, (laughs) I, I have coffee first thing every morning and... If I didn't, I don't know what would happen. To me. <laughs> and I'm drinking coffee now. So, so tea is fine. It's like, you know, I put in a category like, like lemonade and, you know, Fresca and whatever, a bunch of other drinks that are fine. Those occasional, <laughs> if, if it's the only thing that's on the menu kind of piece. All right. Right. You're like asking a hero an addict. Do you like pizza? <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, pizza's good, I guess. <laughs> Nothing wrong with pizza. But were we talking about, about heroin? <laughs> yeah, right, right. There's interest. I mean, well, that we this is a speed round. We're, we're getting way too this often. This is a speed round. The weeds yes. here. All right. So here we go. All right. If you could have dinner with any researcher, living or dead, who would it be? Oh, such a good question. You know, I would go for Sigmund Freud. Yeah. I disagree with a lot of what the man said, <laughs> but but he was by all accounts brilliant, could be rather charming, and um and just a fascinating person. I, that is kind of interesting. A, this is a, oh yeah. It's a weird tangent, but would you invite George Lundstein along because George is the great grandson of Freud? I'd be happy to do that. I, I, I could do that. Yeah. Could have Anna Freud there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Carl Jung, Freud's most famous student, make a party out of it. Oh, oh. Wow. That Actually, would be an interesting dinner. Yeah. Okay. Now this came from the book. It's a little bit esoteric, but we found it kind of funny and charming. But does drinking sauerkraut juice make you more likely to endorse a right wing candidate? It does not. <laughs> we can never know for sure. And although there are suggestive <laughs> results, it's the kind of study that I say we should be very cautious about. And I'm going to be very cautious about and say probably no. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. It is an interesting that. that the mixture that we get from causality and correlation, and, and you know, it's still you got to remind everybody all the time about yep. how that works, right? So, yep. yeah. All right, last one, and I'm glad we didn't use a Star Wars reference here. So we're we're going <laughs> Star Trek. Here we go. If Spock and Data from Star Trek were real people, would they actually be good leaders because they are so rational? It's kind of a trick question because mm. Spock and Data would be extraordinary leaders. They do very, very well in their lives. But the story of Spock and Data are that they lack emotions. Yes. So their emotions are very submerged. If that story were true, they would be terrible leaders. They would lack gratitude, compassion, fear, anger, anxiety. And because of that, in a thousand ways, both big and small, they'd be disastrous leaders and disastrous people. <laughs> and so, so, and, and, and it's important because I talk about this, these cases, as you know, in the course of making an argument that emotions aren't noise in the system. They're not something which through possible Zen Buddhism training or stoicism or whatever, whatever you have on your plate, you should try to get rid of. No, your fear is very useful. Your anxiety is very useful. Your shame, your guilt, your anger form critical roles there for a purpose. And if somebody just stripped them away from you, you would be lost. Yeah. You know, there are people like this. There are people who have brain damage. Uh, Damasio studies them, yeah. where they lose a lot of their emotions. And these are not brave superheroes. They sit all the time in the couch and have no idea what they want to do next because they don't. They're not. They don't have any motivation. I remember they the story slice. from Damasio about picking out a dinner. And the hours it would take for some of those patients that he has because they're weighing every little piece of what it is. And it just, it sounds like a horrible, horrible, horrible life. And to your point, I love the idea that Data and and, and Spock actually do have emotions and they come yeah. out, but the their kind That's of their story, story. The, the way that they're supposed to be designed, it would be horrible. So I will give you that. As a Star Trek fan, I will give you that. There you go. So... We could bring this to an end now. We have reached convergence. So, Paul, as we talked about at the beginning, the book is expansive, right? It covers a lot of ground. And we've talked with a lot of authors who point out that they really had to cut some really good information from the book when they're making it. In this book, did you have to trim anything from the book that you thought would have been really good to keep? Or were you able to get it all in? That's an interesting question. There's tons of stuff in the book. 
Yeah. There's great. tons of stuff <laughs> that didn't make it to the book. Oh. <laughs> and sometimes I say, I say to people, I, I wrote a book on psychology and they say, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about hypnosis. <laughs> or I can't wait to hear what you say. I have to say about the obscure, obscure Norwegian psychologist, you know, Lorne Bornsberg. I hope you have a chapter on Lorne Bornsberg. And I say, I, uh, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and, but if I was given a chance tomorrow to add to the book, yeah, I wouldn't. I think that um, I, oh. I did my my best face effort to to cover the most important, critical, serious aspects of the field. I I have my own research that, that I don't discuss in a book mm-hmm, just because right. I don't think it belongs in a book like that. And um and so I try I try to include everything of real value and excitement and importance, but not more. Mm. So I have a chapter on Freud and I defend why I have a chapter on Freud, but I don't have a chapter on Carl Jung. Because yeah. I don't think somebody who's interested in psychology needs to know about Carl Jung. How? Well, how to what degree does the book sort of parallel your psych 101? class originally was going to parallel it very tightly this was the covid book and i had my notes in front of me for my course my course was made into an online course that had a million people taking it there were all these transcripts of my lectures i was going to actually just kind of type them all down edit them (laughs) send it out to my publisher and get enough money to renovate my house yeah dust (laughs) and done yeah (laughs) that's and done it was this this is going to be the easy one and and did that happen it was it did not happen because (laughs) I started with Freud. I made my chapter on Freud based on my lectures, and it was so anemic. It, it, oh. None of it, oh, no, there's so many more stories to be told about him. I, I get into this. So I worked on it, and it was three, four times as long. <laughs> and every other chapter went this way. So now, in a sense, if you read this book, it's not a textbook. It's meant to be read. It's meant to be fun and interesting. But if you read the book, you'll get way more than you would get if you took your average intro psych course, just because there's so much more to it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you, you, could, you could write a lot more in a book than you could give in a series of lectures. That's a really interesting piece. And I love that you say you start with Freud and prior to the interview in, or, you know, when we were, were talking about who you wanted to, in the speed round, who you wanted to have as dinner party, and it was Freud, even though you disagree with a lot of his work, yeah. but he's still such an important figure in the development of this, that that was a, a really interesting piece. So I love how that that goes. So yeah, yeah. Freud was not my first chapter. I start with the brain. Oh, that's true. I apologize. The brain. Yeah. And then and then no, no, you're not saying anything different. Um, I then have a chapter on consciousness because I think consciousness is probably the most interesting of everything, just intuitively, what it's yeah. like to be alive. And then it's Freud. And then <laughs> and I and I hit the ground running with Freud. And Freud is uh, I teach Freud for a million reasons. One is that. He's the psychologist everybody's heard of. Yeah. You know, I ask you, name a psychologist. Yeah. You're not going to say, oh, Bloom. You're not gonna say, <laughs> you say Freud. <laughs> he says Freud. And, and he percolates through our, our consciousness. We, uh, every time we say about somebody, uh, you know, he has an anal personality. Yeah. Or, or you say to someone, look, I'm not your mother. There's Freud in you. That's Freud kind of right there. Channeling whether you know it or not. And although Freud has some terrible ideas, I'm happy to talk about them. Really, the, some of the dumbest ideas that have ever passed through somebody's mind, he had some brilliant ones as well. And I think his big pitch for a dynamic unconscious, the idea that, that we don't really know why we do what we do, is, has enormous staying power. and is now part and parcel of, of psychology now. And he deserves a lot of credit for it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we, uh, you know, as we... Kurt and I and Mary uh, prepare for our conversation today. We, well, first we read the book and then we, you know, I was prepared a lot of questions and we didn't have a lot of questions about Freud, but honestly, just bringing that up, Paul does make me think, do you know, talk, would you mind sharing a little bit about your, your commentary on, on Freud that as an important figure, but some of the issues that you have with Freud as well? Yeah. Um, there are some intro site courses that don't teach Freud. And they say, you know, you know, it's 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 set a date. We don't believe him anymore. Why bother teaching him? I know some psychologists who are embarrassed by him. The metaphor I give is like a, a pharmaceutical company that got its start by selling meth. Mm. You know, maybe, maybe that maybe he was one of our originators, but but we don't like to, wow. to put we're not gonna put a big a big picture of him up in the conference room. Um uh, he was in many ways a charlatan, he was a yeah. liar. He was uh, 
viciously ambitious and did all sorts of dirty tricks to promote his cause. But he also was a beautiful writer, nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature, winner of other prestigious awards for writing, a well-known scholar in his time, and an incredibly brave and important thinker. You could get on him for his overemphasis on sex, and I think you should. I think some of it's kind of silly. I don't think, for instance, that a pivotal moment in every child's life is the moment he or she accidentally discovers his parents making love, the primal scene. <laughs> I think, you know, it happens. I think it happens sometimes, but, you know, yeah. I don't know. I, I would have imagined it would have had locks back then, and, and you know, I don't think it's as important. But he did recognize female sexuality a topic which was forbidden for many. And he recognized in some way the sexuality of adolescents and even of children in some ways. Yeah. Sexuality taking on a bit of a different meaning when you're talking about children, but, but crushes, yeah. desires. And he opened us up, I think, to our modern world where many of us are more permissive towards people with unusual sexual drives and sexual interests. You know, one way to put it is that you know, for Freud, everyone was a pervert. Mm. And if everyone's a pervert, nobody's a pervert. Yeah. And then at one point, Freud says, let me tell you the three biggest shocks to humanity. The first is that we were not the center of the universe. The universe, we were just one part of an extraordinarily large universe, but we're not really in the middle. The second is from Darwin, which is that we did not go through special creation. The existence of, of our bodies is no different in kind from the forces that gave rise to horses and cockroaches and worms and monkeys. But then Freud said the big, so Freud was not a modest man. <laughs> kind of deal. <laughs> no, but the, the no. biggest, the biggest, most mind-blowing shock to our egos comes from my very school of psychoanalysis, where he says, we are not masters of our fate. Ah. We might think that we fall in love, we have an enemy, we start a podcast, we do different projects, and we, and we know why we're doing them. And Freud came in and said, you might think you know it, but you don't. Yeah. We're, you're driven by forces beyond our control. And a lot of details he had to say about there, I think, are wrong. But the general idea, which wasn't his, I mean, even, even he acknowledged the idea of unconscious has preceded Freud. It wasn't his. But the idea is tremendous force. And now it's, it's, now it's accepted by most everybody. Yeah. You know, I know psychologists who are interested in why people vote. Like, why did somebody vote for Biden or vote for Trump? And you know what you don't do? You don't go and ask them why you vote. <laughs> because you, you, might, you might be curious what they say, but you don't figure out what they say, then write it as that, well, now we know. Because it is fully possible and almost certainly true that people who voted for Trump or for Biden don't really know why they did that. They might have theories, but they, they don't really know. Yeah. And that mode of thinking, I think, uh, Freud gets a lot of credit for. So again, as Tim said, we didn't really have a lot of questions on on Freud or on Skinner, but I want to ask you the same question that Tim asked about Freud uh, about Skinner, because again, including him in the book, obviously he plays an important part in the yeah. history. Uh, but again, many of his kind of the, the behaviorism that he talked about has kind of fallen on the wayside, but still it's important enough to get in the book. So can you talk a little bit, uh, just kind of bringing in Skinner to this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I have a lot less love for Skinner. <laughs> you didn't invite him to dinner. We Let's just say that. Yeah, <laughs> he, he would not have made my dinner list. Um, I am old enough that when I was a graduate student, he gave a talk at Harvard and I went and visited and heard him talk. So I, I was in the same room as a great man. And, um, he had a theory that was in some way the perfect opposite of Freud's. Freud filled the head with all sorts of stuff, an id, an ego, a superego, defense mechanisms, an Oedipal complex, a death instinct, all this crazy <laughs> stuff. And Skinner said, what if we did a psychology where we fill the head with nothing? Yeah. Not just getting rid of Freud's crazy stuff, but getting rid of things like memories, wishes, plans, interests motivations, and seeing how far we go, just talking in terms of stimulus and response. And his model there was the, the white rat, sometimes the pigeon. And he argued that the brain was fundamentally a blank slate, totally empty. And through proper training and contingency, you can, uh, we can do things like talk, make ourselves coffee, 
you know, make our way into the world. And this, the, the basic learning principles that we use, operant conditioning, where we respond to reward and punishment, classical conditioning, where we, we're like, you know, Pavlov's dogs, we make connections between different things. That's sufficient. That's all we need to become full-blown humans. And I think that this intellectual research program was a huge failure. That there, it's just, and in some way, it's insane. It's insane, and 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 it's been been proven false actually yeah. in, in a million ways, including by computers. Where if you have to explain how how a computer like ChatGPT works, you talk about what's going on inside. You say what it, it learn. It has these sorts of memory systems and these sorts of learning procedures and so on. So why do I have them in a book at all? Well, just like um, just like Freud, you got to. You got to learn how to understand your New Yorker cartoons. You got to you got to get the, the popular <laughs> references. You got to get the jokes. Um, two behaviorists uh, meet up in a conference and they uh, have sex. And at the end of it, one of them said to the other one, "It was good for you. How was it for me?" <laughs> <laughs> so because they have no introspective access to their own yeah. zero. So, you you have read to, you read have the to, chapter. Yeah. You'll get that wonderful yeah. joke, and your life will yeah. be improved. But look, <laughs> also. Also, the learning mechanisms that Skinner talked about, yeah. class conditioning, operant conditioning, and so on, are real. Yeah. They're how we uh, train train dogs. We, they're how we train animals. There's some extent we how we deal with, with people. Yep. And, you know, if you're undergoing chemotherapy and you eat a familiar food and get sick while you eat it, that food might become aversive to you, and that's a form of class conditioning. Slot machines yeah. yep. illustrate operant conditioning where the rewards titrate in a certain yeah. way. I mean, Those for me, variable ratio I feel, reward payouts. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. The variable ratio reward, the intermittent reward effect, where yep. if the rewards come few and far between, you keep banging away at the thing, <laughs> waiting for it to come next time. And yeah. I don't do the slots, but I sometimes I'm up three in the morning and I got my phone in front of me. I got, I got like a Twitter and I'm doing that, that, that thumb up motion, yep. looking for some, looking for some, like and I've never felt more like a Skinnerian rat in a cage. <laughs> so you, know, you got, you have to give them some credit. Well, and you, you think about that, the, the piece that I always think about when I think about Skinner and behaviorism and that whole field is that, it, and correct me if I'm mistaken here, but they dominated the field of psychology for a number of decades and kind of, yes, you're right, that there are aspects yeah. of this that are true, but the the idea that cognition is like, we don't have to th study this, we shouldn't even, actually don't study it because it actually pushes us in the wrong, wrong way. And I'm wondering if you think that pushed the field back in, in any way because of the dominance of Skinner and his cohorts. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, yeah. I think they cost us about thirty years. Yeah, wow. I think I think I think I th I th they really they were a weird cult. <laughs> they had their discoveries. They made it, they made some degree of progress. I'm, mm -hmm. I kind of think science goes where it goes, and it's not up to sort of higher authorities to say let's shut down this program, get a new one. It'll just take its time. But this radical shift where you stop studying language and memory and yeah. emotions and decision making and instead how it's it's a million papers on a proper way to train a rat to run a maze <laughs> and you know and when i took when i was an undergraduate at mcgill i took an obligatory lab methods course and i studied rats and you know and, and i made rats run a cage <laughs> and run a maze and i think this was not without its value yeah we did learn something but, like, um, like replicating but, Clark Hall's kind of work, the, that that stuff. Uh, like which it, which work? Sorry, the, the the Clark Hall sort of uh, classic. Yes, exactly, you know, exactly. Stuff, yeah. When I was a prof at, at Yale, they had a, one of Clark Hall's graphs on the board, and this was a great thing. And 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 psychologists like Thorndike and Hall and and Skinner himself and Watson and Pavlov yeah. did discover some really cool and powerful things about how the mind works. Discoveries that have gotten into, integrated into neuroscience, discoveries that have made a practical difference in people's lives. So by no means am I saying the world would be better if it's simply eradicated. But on the other hand, we spent a lot of years on this. We spent a lot of years on this where people who were interested in some things were immediately told, we're not going to look at your paper until you do, you do it with rats. And if, if what you're interested in is, you know, 
how people reason about the distant future or how we morally judge, how we decide to punish moral wrongdoers or a million other things, you're out of luck. The field, the field had little interest in you. I mean, you're bringing up all these great names. It's just like, man, I just feel like we could just do a deep dive like on all this stuff. Mm. But I remember in the book, you actually mentioned that you worked down the hall from the rooms where Henry Milgram did his famous shock experiments. He did studies in the basement, the basement of, of SSS. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, I, 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 you know, there's this part of me that's like, no, again, I, I feel like I should be devoid of anything like that. Like, you know, I'm a big guitar guy and, you know, I got to play one of Eric Clapton's guitars one time because it was, you know, for sale at a local music shop. I was like, oh man, like this was, this was slow hands guitar. It's just amazing to think about that and to like have my hands on the fingerboard. And I'm thinking it's just a damn guitar. It's just, that, that's so stupid. But still, if you were like working in the same building as Milgram, was there kind of but a still, vibe? It was, it was a while ago. I, I'd love to tell you that the timing worked that I could hear the screams of the <laughs> you know, going through. You're not that, that old. old. Yeah, there you go. But I'm not that old. No. Um, no. Uh, just to remind everybody, Milgram did the famous experiments at Yale where he uh, he brought in uh, just these you know, middle-aged guys, uh, not academics, tend to be working men. And he just said, we'll get a little experiment for you. We're going to help us teach somebody. And so he, then they met somebody and, you know, a big Irish guy, very, very amicable, shakes hands, go to another room, says, here's how you teach. And you, get, and you see a bunch of electric shocks going down from, from, from mild to severe, all the way to XXX. And then the idea is you give them memory things to remember. And then the person in another room spits it back. If you make a mistake, you have a little shock. He goes, okay, whatever, do that. And what he didn't know was the whole thing was rigged. There were no shocks, actually. The guy in the other room was a trained actor. Uh, what they were hearing was not screams, but recordings. And what Milgram was interested in had nothing to do with memory. He was interested in thinking back on the Holocaust. He was thinking, like, can you take a normal man just off the street and get him to kill somebody? And basically, his finding is you could. The shocks kept going up and up. I've seen the films. You guys, you see yeah, them online. Films are, the men are sweating. Oh, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're shook up. But, they, but a lot of them kept going. They kept going. They kept saying, look, this is ridiculous. I want to stop. I don't, I, I, we're hurting the guy. He's, he's screaming. He, he's not responding. And he told me he had a heart condition. So who knows what's happening here? Let's get a doctor in here. And all the experimenter did, that young man wearing a white coat said, the experiment must go on. Yeah. That's all he said. And ultimately, the majority of people went all the way. Yeah. To the XXX, the guy's not responding, XXX. And then the experiment's over, the guy pops up. It's just a joke. It's just a study. <laughs> Nobody's really heard. Ho, ho, ho. And, you know, it, it revolutionized psychology. Nobody predicted this response. Yeah. It led to the birth of human ethics committees. Yeah. Because many people, <laughs> yeah, including yes. me, yeah, think for good this is not a nice thing to do for a guy who's trying to make some beer money, you know, in, <sighs> before he just heads off to home. But yeah, that was... Milgram himself was a fascinating man. He had all sorts of studies. He he thought of the idea of seven degrees of separation. Okay. And actually did experiments how far away we are from any other individual. He um he had all these ideas before he left Yale, because he did not get promoted at Yale. He um he was telling his friends that he wanted to do an exper a version of the Milgram experiment with husbands and wives. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, he went to high school with uh with Phil Zimbardo. And we got some interesting stories about Stanley Milgram from when we talked to Zimbardo. It's, it's, yeah. it's kind of wild to think about like all that talent in the, you know, the same place, but. It was kind of a wild West time in psychology. Yeah. There, there's an onion headline saying something like most psychology experiments in 1970s were basically just crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you and think about a lot of them were pretty heavy duty. Yeah, the, the prison experiment, the, yeah. that one, yeah, we, all sorts of them we, were there. We, we we don't do a lot of them these days. Yeah. Well, I you know we uh, I don't know why this is popping into my head, but we had a conversation. We've had conversations with uh, Brian Lowry at Stanford and John Barge at um, at Yale about free will, and yeah. You know, we're, we're kind of riffing on this really kind of heady stuff. I'm wondering, would you would you mind taking a minute to to just give us your uh, 
What's your elevator speech on free will? <laughs> How about that? The elevator speech is that everything that happens is caused by something else. Everything that, you know, physical things, psychological things is caused by something else. And if you could see, if, if you were savvy enough, you could take this snapshot of a moment. And if you knew where every molecule in the world was, you could predict a day, a year, a thousand years later, where we would all be and what everything is happening. There is the feeling that I could choose to pick up my coffee cup or, uh, or pick up a glass of water next to me. And I really feel that it's up to me. But how much of that survives if one of you could just say, no, I know what he's going to do. I know how the universe works. It's going to be one or other. All that exists is causal forces, genes, environments, and that's it. There's no secret sauce. There's nothing extra, no free will bit of extra. Now, having said that, I think there's a perfectly good use of the term free will or making a choice or reasoning, which captures a certain psychological process. If there's water here and coffee here, it makes sense that I choose which one. As long as you don't think that that's magic, as long as you don't think that some magical process exempts me from the causal universe. So I fall into the cat compatibilist category where <laughs> we talk about free, free. Dan Dennett had a nice example, which he, which, which he says, look, physicists have learned a lot about time. And they learn a lot about time that doesn't really fit our common sense notion of time. But you don't typically say, oh my gosh, physicists have shown that time doesn't exist. What you say is, we have a notion of time and it doesn't quite match the reality. Okay. I feel the same way about choice and free will and decision, which is upon reflection, we've learned a lot of these things and don't have the sort of magical properties we thought they did. But I think they still nonetheless exist just as time exists. Uh, that's, that's the long, longish elevator pitch. That no, that's a sort of perfect elevator. elevator. That's a good pitch. elevator. Yeah, yeah. Sort of. 40th floor, yeah. something needed to get off the 20th. <laughs> we, were going, we were going up, you know, uh, some very tall, uh, very, tall very building. tall uh, skyscraper in New York. It's interesting because I, I always, when, when I think about this and have talked with Tim and some others, it's always like, all right, so if you took yourself back in time, if you were able to time travel back to that very moment where you picked up coffee or, or your water, uh, with all the things leading up to it being the same, is there any way that you would have picked a different route, right? You, if you picked water the first time, would you somehow be able to yeah. pick coffee the next? And when you think through the process, no, that doesn't, that doesn't seem some. to work, right? Yeah. The only way you can get in a yes is you say there's some quantum indeterminacy. Yeah, that, as level. But that doesn't give you free will. That just throws in noise. <laughs> That just throws in, in, in you know, Schrodinger's cat into the equation. And, and this is just random as we're, we're going there. I mean, there's another debate in psychology that people like this get involved in which is the idea in which our be the extent to which our behaviors are are set in motion by factors that are out of our control. Yeah. And sometimes people say we deny free will. They say, what about all these studies showing that whether or not you're going to vote for Obama depends on the color of the room, yeah. whether you think a, a job candidate is a good is a warm person depends on whether you're holding a warm coffee coffee cup, how confident you are depends on how you stand and so on. And I talk about this a lot in the book, and I think there's some findings that have some force, but for the most of, uh, for the most part, these studies have failed to replicate. This is one of this is one of the areas where psychology has kind of let us down. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump again and and ask a question that we don't have written down here. So, if you wrote this book, say you, you amazing life, you live another fifty years. All right, and and you get to you get to revise this book. What, who do you think or what research do you think from, you know, the, the recent past here might get included in that wasn't in there already? Yeah, that's a nice thought experiment. I think some parts of the book, some things I say about the brain, about, uh, about kids' memory, yeah. will be there to stay. There'll be, there'll be further studies, but some there's sort of things which feel like discoveries. You could always be wrong, but they feel like discoveries of how things work. And, and I might not have to edit them that much. Other parts of the book will be radically revised. I think the book is, would, would have an enormous chunk devoted to what we've learned about artificial intelligence mm. and what it is like to be living with other intelligent beings at minimum or even uh, other conscious beings and what that tells us about ourselves 
and and this is in many ways something some things we find from uh, these these AIs might challenge psychological theories, but also psychological these AIs properly used could serve as co-investigators mm. to help us learn about the mind. So I would see that as a big transformation. The other big transformation would be uh, in clinical psychology. So a lot of people identify clinical psychology with clinical psychology. I, I have a friend of mine who says, uh, I'm a psychologist, but not the kind that helps people. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm, if I'm on a plane or something, that's a pretty good line. Because then they don't then they stop telling me about how their, their adolescent teenagers won't stop won't stop, you know, pickpocketing <laughs> or why uh, or, 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 or why they always they always dream about being trapped in a tunnel. Like and I so I just you know I I, experience, I, I study children, I study morality, I study this, that, but I, I'm not a therapist. But a lot of psychologists are therapists, psychologists and psychiatrists. And there's a there's a rich science of what causes schizophrenia, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, and what helps it, what's the best treatment for it. I'm in a room, there's four of us here. Just by the odds, one of us has probably seen treatment for depression or anxiety. Yeah. It's that common. And then there's rarer disorders like schizophrenia. 1% of the population maybe that are savage in their effects. And, and what a world it would be if we can make things better. And the reason why I'm focusing on this is that, I know people are going to yell at me for saying this, but my sense is that that field has been relatively stagnant. I quote people who point ahead, like the head of the National Institutes of Health, who says, I put billions and billions and billions of dollars into mental health research, and I don't think we've gotten back anything. We don't have a decline in suicide rates. We don't have an improvement in depression. We don't have powerful new drugs. If you go to a shrink's office now, and you went to a shrink's office 20 years ago, it's not going to be that different. The pills might be the same. Mm -hmm. the, what they say to you might kind of be the same. And it's not like we've whipped mental illness, so we're just doing our victory lab. Now there's a lot more to go. Therapy helps, but we want to do better. And my feeling, my hope, is that in 50 years, it's my, my clinical chapter is going to look something totally different. Yeah, We're going to have more of an understanding of mental disorders. We're going to have much better treatments. Some of the new ideas are going to pan out. Some people have a psychedelics. A lot of research on that. My, look, working in mindfulness meditation, even things like uh, like some sort of cranial electrical stimulation where they zap your brain in certain ways. Yeah. A lot of this is in progress. Some of it, I hope, I pray, will work out, and then the world will be changed. And then I have to rewrite my book. Paul, it makes me think about the role that neuroscience might play in psychology. Is that on the increase? Do you think, or or is it increasing fast enough? I think neuro, neuroscience, and here, so I'll tell you about the book in some way, because it's not a textbook. No. A textbook gives the party line about everything, is enthusiastic <laughs> about everybody, talks about, you know, never says a bad thing. And I try to give an accurate picture of the field as best I know, and I've had experts bet every word of it. But I will at times say, hey, you guys are doing it wrong, I think. I think neuroscience, in some important way, has really failed to meet its promise. This is not to doubt that the mind is the brain. The mind is the brain. This is, it all happens between our ears. And it's not to doubt that there are some real discoveries about thinking that have derived from careful studies of the brain. But at least to date, studies of the brain have given us surprisingly little about insight into how the mind works. Mm -hmm. We, there are findings about memory and memory failures that could just blow your mind. Really cool findings. There are findings about implicit racism, about um, how people differ. This is amazing. So little of this comes from putting people in scanners or taking out their tissues and looking at them and so on. And it, again, it's not because our thought is in this ephemeral, an immaterial soul. Rather, it's because there doesn't seem to be a direct enough relationship between what the mind does and what the brain does to, to get much purchase from it. This may change a lot in 50 years. And in 50 years, maybe the field of neuroscience will do sort of a hostile takeover of my own field. <laughs> we'll all be neuroscientists. But I'll tell you, for, for a long, long time, for decades and decades, people have been... Um, putting on the pages of the top journals, findings saying, hey, you know, if you think about 
how hungry you are. This part of the brain lights up. We go, oh, that's really amazing. But what does it mean? I say, it doesn't mean anything yet, but wait, <laughs> wait till we wait till we get to our next stage and we're gonna learn the mysteries of hunger. Well, we're always waiting. Yeah, it's it's fascinating when you, you bring it that way. Cause my question was going to be the very same. Like I thought you would be talking about the brain and the neuroscience findings of all of this in, yep. in 50 years. But but to your point, you know, is this just in your mind that they're looking at the wrong things or just that we don't have the technology to address those? Or is it some underlying concept of that, as you said, mind, brain, uh, how they, how the mind is formed from the brain structures that we just can't get to and probably won't be able to get to at least um, in, the, in the near future. Yeah. These are extremely smart people working in the area. Mm-hmm. I think some of our, our smartest scholars have gone into neuroscience and computational studies. I don't think there's a sort of metaphysical reason why we're, we're going to hit a blockade. I just think it's very hard. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and I also sometimes think it's the wrong level. So, so go back to computer. You have a chess computer. You say, I really want to know how that chess computer beats me so consistently. What you want to know is it's program. What, well, how's it doing it? How's it judging the configuration of pieces? How's it making plans and everything? You don't actually want somebody to come in with a, a soldering eye, to open it up, scrape it open, put electrodes in it, pull it apart take a microscope and look at his pieces. You don't doubt for a minute that the chess machine does its magic because of how it's constructed. But the details of which transistor goes where isn't the level of explanation you're, you're, you're looking for. Yeah. And so what you want to know is what program it runs. Similarly, when you want to know why people hate certain outgroups but are okay with other outgroups, you want to know what program they run. You don't necessarily really want to know the stuff it's it's made out of. I'll also add that in some way, just as with the replication crisis, things are to some extent almost going backwards. Mm. Like what I would teach in intro psych five years ago is that depression has a lot to do with serotonin and the drugs that cure depression have a lot to do with modifying serotonin. And people have looked at this very closely and it's not clear either, either claim is true. We really don't know the relationship between serotonin and depression, and we really don't know how those drugs work. It is that hard. Welcome to The Grooving Session, where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from part one of our discussion with Paul, have a free-flowing conversation, and groove on whatever else comes into our Freudian primed minds. I love that. Yeah, I'm glad. So we're going to talk about Freud. We're going to we're going to have to dig into a little bit of Freud here. So, all right. So it's interesting because you and I both had this conversation like when we were reading the book. It's like a whole chapter on Freud, a whole chapter on Skinner, <laughs> and then we're finally getting into it. But man, yeah. I the the conversation that we had with Paul about Freud. I just thought was fantastic and kind of giving, it makes me want to reread that chapter now because I kind of mm-hmm. glossed over it. I was like, oh, Freud, he's old, forgotten, you know, who cares about <laughs> his stuff anymore? But as he said, Freud permeates our daily world. Yeah. Yeah. Even with all of the stuff that's been disproved, he still, he still dominates a, a lot of the thinking. But there was one thing that really, really caught your attention, as I recall, in in the Freud discussion. There's one idea that you really liked in particular. Oh, there was. There was. I mean, I think it's this idea that we are not masters of our own fate. This this concept of that of the subconscious, you know, before it had been it been around. It's not like it wasn't there, but he he being Freud brought that to the forefront and this idea that uh, again, some of his ideas on that are way off base, but the general idea that the rational self isn't always in control All right. is one of the key, I think, benefits Freud brought to this conversation, to our world in general. And what I thought was interesting, and this is a question that I have for you, maybe for our listeners as well. Does that concept, this idea that we are not masters of our own fate, that many of our actions and behaviors are 
being driven at a subconscious level that we don't have a conscious perspective on, is that liberating or is that scary for you, Tim? That is a really, really damn big question. It is. Because honestly, I feel both. I feel both a sense of, okay, it, it explains a lot of the way the world is and it's sort of satisfying in that regard. But there's also that sense of, I can't help being human and not feel like I am, have agency over what I do. And so feeling like, like I'm not, I mean, sure, I can say, uh, like Paul talks about, you know, you, yeah, m- mine says, I'm going to pick up a glass of water. I'm going to drink a glass of water. So I'm making that decision. But how did I get to that decision? Yeah. And unpacking that scares the daylights out of me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, so it's both, uh, you know, how about you? Did, did you, do you feel, did, did, I, you know, as much as I hate to sound like the, the consultant and different pieces, but it depends it like you, it it's depends. like a bit, a bit of a scary aspect. This idea that, as you said, I don't have agency over everything and that my the reason I'm doing this, do I fully understand why I'm behaving the way I do? I think I do, but maybe I don't. And maybe there's something I'm missing because of all these subconscious processes that are going on in my brain, you know, all of these elements. So that is scary. But I think there's a liberating part of this, at least for me, because now it also allows me to say, well, there's a lot of the outcome that if I am really intent upon getting an outcome and I don't, I, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that the rational conscious part of me might not have had as much influence over that outcome as I maybe thought it did or in, you know, prior to it. So Mm -hmm. I can, I I don't have to ruminate over this or I can't, I I get Then then now I'm sitting here thinking about this and I go, well, maybe I have to ruminate more because I have to understand the processes that go on underneath in order to figure out next time I do it. But at some point it's kind of liberating from that, from that perspective. So what's the point of setting goals if we're not the masters of our own fate? Why, why even have a goal? Oh, oh, are we going to get into this? Here we go. Maybe we should have, you know, Ron Kivitz and I let, uh, you know, Fishbach on this discussion. But why why have a goal at all well, if we are not we a master of our own Because we know that goals actually drive the behavior that we have. And so right. there so you if they So if they do, if we have all this evidence that demonstrates that goals work, then isn't there a part of the we're not masters of our own fate eroded just a bit? And maybe just oh, well, not, yes, it's not... The, oh, Oh, yes, yes. And so, the, but the, but this is the part where it's not, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm getting so wound up on this. <laughs> I know, I know, good, <laughs> this idea, good, you're all wound up. <laughs> this idea that I think that Freud brings into this is that prior to this, I think the general consensus or a lot of it is, look, we have full control over our behaviors and actions and everything we do is within our control. And not going the other way that everything that we do is outside of our control, right? That we are not masters of our own fate. I think probably what we should be saying is that we are partial masters of our fate. And this idea of kind of mastery, you know, having the ability to control the outcome as we think about goals. So setting goals we know helps drive that performance. We don't necessarily know if that is partly subconscious and the, the what's acting on us at a, at a subconscious level, as well as the conscious part of that. But that's really an interesting piece. Okay. I like this idea that maybe we're not the masters of everything, right? There's an, an element of that. Uh, I, I think that that might be a good way of, of framing this because it does sort of question why have goals? Like, how can you be a stoic? 
How, how can you stay? I'm going to execute stoicism in my life and I'm just going to pull myself away from, you know, emotions and, and I get to choose what kind of emotion I have. And, or in Buddhism, you know, that everything between, you know, what is actually happening and what I, what my desires are is just friction and suffering. And part of this is kind of the human condition because we are not masters of our own fate. So I, yeah. I, I really, I am grateful to Freud for pulling us out of a uh, of a world view for centuries that was dominated by the idea that we are our, our own agents and and that everything that happens that we don't control is spiritual you know there was a lot of there was a lot of god did this god mm. did that you know there was a lot of a lot of that it's also worth <laughs> worth noting that that, that freud's influence on our world is outsized really oversized oh. you know based on what he actually contributed uh to the to the world of actual science is pretty small compared to this like we today we talk about the id and the ego like <laughs> freudian slips you know Freudian <laughs> <laughs> they're not they're not hool hand slips they're freudian slips you they're know? Freudian. or how about all all the complexes <laughs> you know anal complex oral complex uh the oedipus complex you know i love my mom and i want to kill my dad it's like holy cow <laughs> penis envy you know all yes, of these things all of it's like oh my gosh which again most of those have been i won't say disproven, but they don't hold up today. They don't hold up, right? right? They're not scientifically valid. They're, they're not scientifically they, valid, but yet they're part of the language and part of the culture of Western civilization, at least. Yes. And so, yeah, an over yeah. extension of the influence of a, you know, a, a great insightful person, but maybe not as good of a scientist. So, all right, let's yeah. go on because we also talked All about right. Skinner and behaviorism. And yeah. um, so for me, uh, the piece that I just found fascinating is when Paul said, yep, you know, this kind of deep dive into behaviorism probably set psychology back 30 years. What do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, well, I don't know how you come up with a number like that. I, I, I don't really... I, I don't understand all of his logic behind it or that it was set back because, you know, because Skinner kind of sent a bunch of psychologists down the wrong road. It was just the road. I mean, there's a part of me that's sort of agnostic about what it was that ah. we were studying. That's just what we did. I mean, how, how can we say that Hegel, you know, threw off the idea of, of uh, philosophy in the you know 1800s because he was um, you know because he was who he is because he had all these wild ideas. I will agree with Paul from this perspective that I think the field was so dominated by behaviorism that other types of research could not get published, did not get funded, was nothing in there. And so, yeah, it was the road that was taken, but we could have we could have had multiple roads and they didn't allow multiple roads. That's fair. That That is fair. Okay. Uh, we could also probably get into Descartes, but we probably shouldn't at this point. Well, Let's talk no, about I mean, priming. Descartes. Uh, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> let, 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 let's talk about priming. How about that? Because Paul has, and, and we've talked to him about this before. He is, I wouldn't say an outspoken critic, but he is a critic of priming. And I, I think that it's worth noting that, you know, he brings up the replication issues with priming as the reason why maybe all of this doesn't work. You know, that there's a real problem there. And when I think about priming, I have to admit, and maybe this is, you know, we, we've talked both about the confirmation bias, and it's also our relationship with John Barge, who has made a compelling argument that priming studies are, you know, show actual priming experiences. Just because they didn't replicate doesn't mean that the experiences that they were revealing weren't real. It's just maybe the generalization hasn't worked so well. I don't know. Uh, that That's kind of my thought. I think you're absolutely right there, Tim. And you just go and look at some of these studies. Yeah, replicate it. I will be the first to admit many of these studies have not replicated. They just don't work. But many of them 
a the there's reasons behind some of that and i go to the asian women study um that was like you do prime asian women on the fact of being women or do you prime them on their asian heritage again different subconscious things about math proficiency with that and when they replicated this study they did it in san francisco and they did it in atlanta and the there was it replicated, I believe, in Atlanta, but it didn't replicate in San Francisco. So right. you have to understand. So what I always look at when I say the, the replication crisis is it just tends to, unless the study was done incorrectly, it was too small. I mean, there is even on a, you know, just in general, you have a, you know, an R factor, a P factor of, of five. That means 5% of the, uh, you know, Five out of a hundred are going to be a false positive, right? So that's right. And and the, right. with a publication bias, you're probably going to be up higher than that, and a variety of other factors that go into this. So there's going to be some of that that happens, but there's also going to be pieces that hey, I didn't replicate that study exactly in the same way, and because of that, there are different factors and influence, particularly as we think about priming, and so that just means we need to understand this more and to dig into it more, at least in my opinion. There we go. Yeah. Well, how about the, how about the Trier uh, stress test that was done, that's been common in the U.S. Uh, and in Western European nations when you put uh, a, a speaker in front of uh, three people with white lab coats <laughs> and they get super stressed. And it's, it's, the, it's Milgram, not just a, the Milgram study where you have the guy in the white can go behind him behind you. He's a person of authority, but... Not in Kenya when this <laughs> study was tried, was replicated in Kenya because the context is different. The Kenyans don't look at at this at the white lab coat guy as being such a bad guy. They think that the white guys in white lab coats are butchers. So <laughs> like, why would I be worried about a butcher? And what do you think? Yeah, come on. And, and, and there's a cultural norm that hey. Kenyans love public speaking. So <laughs> like the idea of standing up in front of a group of experts or people in white lab coats that to the Kenyans look like butchers, like what's the point you know, <laughs> of, of measuring stress? So there's context, right? Context matters. Context matters. There's a number and, of different factors. Yeah, I I exactly. So I, I, I think that it's important that we that we keep the nuances of replication in mind when we talk about uh, priming and the replication crisis. Yeah, I agree that, with you. Mine. I agree with you there. And again, I think the last piece that we can just briefly talk on in the grooving session here is, you know, the future, right? This idea, I, I thought it was interesting how uh, that Paul was saying that, you know, not in so many words here, but he said, you know, neuroscience is kind of a disappointment. It hasn't really delivered on the promise, this idea of understanding what parts of the brain light up when you're doing X activity versus Y activity doesn't necessarily lead to any really good insights as to what we can do. And then this idea that, you know, AI and understanding consciousness moving forward over the next 20, 40, 50 years probably going to be pretty significant. I thought both of those were really, really interesting. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's really important for us to dive back into the idea, uh, dive deeper into mental illness and all the associated issues that go with it. I just feel like we've got a lot of learning that needs to be done. And I'm really glad that Paul kind of calls it out and says, hey, let's, let's actually work on that. Yeah. All right. I think that probably wraps it up. So listeners, that's part one of our two-part episode with Paul Bloom. Make sure that you tune in next week to hear even more great insights, such as understanding how we do good when evolution favors selfishness or what it takes to live a happy life. Yeah, and Groovers, join us in this conversation. Really, we want to talk about this episode or any other ideas around behavioral science. Follow us on Twitter and actually be the, that bold person that actually leaves a comment. Be that amazing. You are a commenter. You're a thoughtful. You're a commenter. Go and leave the comment on one of the podcast apps or on, on one of the social media apps. We want to hear from you. So with that, folks, dip into your subconscious this week and go out and find your groove.